Brilliant. So, uh, uh, before we start, uh, we have two things that we have to address. Kirti, you want to you want to do those uh, the antitrust and the. Uh, well, well, Whipin, uh, I, I don't remember the whole of it, so please feel free to go ahead. Yeah, I mean, there are basically two things. One is the um, one is the fact that we are operating under the antitrust policies of the Linux Foundation, uh, which antitrust, of course, the meaning is uh, shifting now with uh, Lena Khan as the head of FCC uh, and her incredible article on antitrust is, uh, you know, is really a eye opener to the concept of uh, uh, antitrust. I urge you to read it if you haven't. So with that antitrust policy, uh, then the second thing we have to uh, address is the code of conduct, which basically means that we treat each other with respect, even when we are disagreeing. Uh, that's essentially it, plus, you know, the fact that we should be uh, attributing uh, other people's work if uh, we are quoting them. Um, in fact, I have to open with the statement that most of this work is derived from material that is out there. It is not by any means just original, but there are some original thoughts that we will provide during the discussion. Uh, Kirti, you want to go ahead and talk about, introduce yourself and I can introduce my myself and then we can go from there. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Wipin. So my name is Kirti, uh, Kirti Goglamudi. Um, I'm currently pursuing a research uh, at Token Academy um, into uh, basic ILS uh, construct for uh, SolWinC2, so which is more of possibility of uh, a fit for security uh, tokens in regulated environment using AMM. So this is more of an exploratory conversation, and this is where um, we think we can uh, share some of the findings from our basic research, as well as um, look at broader application of um, these methodologies uh, into regulated space. So that's that's been my basic objective. Um, Whipin, off to you. Yeah, as you know, I have been leading this uh, group for a while um, and uh, launched, helped launch this group and also the identity group uh, in Hyperledger. And I'm also active in interoperability in Digital Currency Global Initiative, as Mark knows. And the other thing I have to say is, uh, I have been sort of on the sidelines looking at what is happening in DeFi because everybody's talking about it, of course. Uh, and then I tried to delve deep into it as more of a educational component for me, uh, but, uh, as we go through the talk, I'll provide my uh, my insights that I've learned or the parallels that I draw with my experience, which is in capital markets, fixed income, um, you know, in big investment banks and also in other areas, primarily a technologist. Uh, so Kirti, you want to drive this, uh, you want to say anything about this agenda that we have in front of us? Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. So this is, again, uh, going to be a very guided conversation. And um, mostly, we welcome a lot of participation as a, as a part of the agenda. Um, so the basic outline for today's agenda is more on terminology, trying to understand a few terms which are relevant to you know, the, the DeFi space. We'll briefly touch upon yield farming and the, the strategy that drives yield farming. Why do people actually do this? Uh, then we'll talk about some of the basic building blocks 
uh, of yield farms such as the AMM and liquidity pools. And of course, the last bit is to more kind of touch upon the promise and the risks and perhaps look at some of the um, material which is out there. And of course, contemplate on how things could go wrong and where we are on the maturity curve and what we think uh, could possibly um, evolve from this uh, initial um, exploration. Vipin, um, to you. Uh, next, you know, let's go to the uh, right to the terminology. Um, so, I mean, I, either I can take this or uh, Kirti, you can do it, but. Uh, sure, no, no, I'm happy to kind of take this up. Yeah. So like the basic construct is like, we, a lot of people have heard of yield farming, DeFi, uh, what that all means, you know? So um, yield farming is perhaps uh, the best way of putting it is uh, a predefined strategy for creating yield. And this predefined or pre-programmed strategy uh, is uh, basically created through a bunch of uh, uh, smart contracts uh, or call it a protocol. And um, this is generally uh, one of the most basic strategies that you could probably see is lending and market making today. Um, and that's what it is. Uh, automated market making is, um, it, this is like a, possibly a, a, some sort of a revolution. Not that you know um, the basic mathematics behind it has always existed, but now that people are able to do this through uh, smart contracts and able to trade this through um, a decentralized system it makes it really exciting. So um, AMM is a type of a decentralized exchange um, and it allows for digital assets to be traded. So obviously you have basic actors. So the basic actors are people who look at the whole, you know, um, construct the pool. And of course you have the traders who are active participants who are um, taking in and utilizing the services of these de decentralized exchanges, of course. Um, next is a uh, total value locked. So what does that mean? So total lo value locked is a, uh, is a metric which defines the size of a particular DeFi market. And it, it, it is kind of um, like possibly uh, a sum of all the value, uh, which is back to some sort of a US dollar uh, indication of the total value of the uh, pool. Um, so you could probably say the total value locked in Uniswap or total value locked in uh, Binance could be an indicator of, you know, what, what is the actual money which is available there and like, what, vice versa. You could also talk about it in, in context of a trading pool. So the, these are the relevant ways of looking at it. Liquidity pools. Um, liquidity pools are um, these little, um, I would say, innovative smart contracts, uh, which run basically on a specific algorithm. And um, these are responsible to help you swap one asset for another. They're always traded in pairs and um, they can kind of support or facilitate different types of strategies that is trading, lending. And, and some of the most popular ones that you may all have already heard of are uh, Uniswap, PancakeSwap, uh, Pickle, Pickle is another one, Aave. So, you, you know, all of these, uh, you, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of these uh, products out there in the market DeFi space. Um, liquidity providers and LP tokens. Um, for a back, bad, <laughs> for a for a lack of better choice of words, I would simply call uh, these people as brave individuals who are ready to kind of provide some sort of a collateral to big in uh, a pool and provide liquidity to a pool in exchange for. Uh, LP token. LP token is nothing but um, a receipt to say that on a smart contract, it, 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 it issues an LP token, uh, which is a digital token indicating the share of collateral that is provided by uh, a liquidity provider to the specific pool. And of course, flash loan is, is a loan um, that is provided within the time frame it takes to create a new block on blockchain. So this is more of a, a similar loan product, but it is, it's defined by a pre-programmed strategy again. So it's got like a start time, end time within which, you know, this 
this contract can execute. So that is the basic outline and ba popular terminology in, in DeFi space. Moving on. Yeah, so I can uh, go, take this one. Um, so basically there are three components to yield according to the, uh, according to one of the references. Uh, one would be the borrowing demand, which obviously as the demand for a, any particular token increases, uh, I mean, demand for a particular token increases because of the bull market associated with it. So um, the yield on that, to borrow that particular token would uh, increase, uh, the, the, the yield on that would increase uh, with the demand. Uh, for example, I think they cite the USDC increased from two to three percent uh, APY, uh, which is uh, a year-on-year -year, uh, API, uh, and the revenue sharing token, uh, revenue sharing yield is comes through uh, either participating in a, a loan pool or in a liquidity pool, the tokens that result from that, and that um also pr pr produces yield in the in terms of revenue sharing and then you have liquidity mining which is to bootstrap the pool when you give uh when you provide any asset uh into the pool it get you get tokens in return which uh, have prices on their own plus it allows you certain rights uh, but beyond all that, you have to remember that in the liquidity pools, often there is a pair, like a, like Kirti said, the pair is going to be, one side is going to be always, uh, most of the time, a stable coin, and the other side is going to be one of the more popular tokens being traded. So it's always uh, this uh, twin always exists only because and as uh, the stablecoin provides low volatility and the other other sides provides high volatility which is used to extract uh, uh, yield from other areas but in the main it is the price going up that causes the speculation. Uh, if the price were to dip, then uh, liquidity disappears like in regular markets. Uh, anyway, you wanna go to the next slide? Definitely. So um, over here, we, we talk about basic yield farming protocols and now, um, the simple question to ask is uh, what, why yield farming protocols and why not anything else? Because basically the definition in DeFi space is to look at AP, APY uh, optimization. All that means is how much of returns can you make per year by some sort of, you know, by giving away your security tokens or locking away your security tokens in some sort of a pool. And um, these strategies are, are the most popular strategies that exist in the market today. And, and they are basically two uh, profound protocols which enable um, these, um, this yield forming strategy altogether. Most of the times these are pre-programmed pre strategies. So what it does is um, for the protocol for um, loanable funds, um, again, it's lending and borrowing of on-chain assets. So you could put in one coin and borrow um, something. But the basic step is to kind of first create some sort of a colla uh, collateral pool, which is a stable coin collateral pool. And then you go away and borrow some funds and create a pool and then create some sort of a liquidity for that liquidity mechanism for that specific pool. So it's like a four step strategy. And uh, these yield farming protocols um, have a combination of, um, you know, um, 
these uh, learnable fund protocols as well as AMM protocols together. So, you know, uh, on one side, you're lending something. On the other side, you're also creating some sort of liquidity by providing some sort of a token, uh, a LP token perhaps, um, which is issued for the collateral that you provide. So uh, an automated market maker, on the other hand, is its core functionality is to provide liquidity. And, and while providing liquidity, um, uh, what does it mean? Is it enables trades that swap uh, different types of swaps, again, in a token pair. So people can come in if they wanted to uh, exchange their ETH for DAI, they could use this pool, uh, they pay a small fee. Uh, this fee is again, you know, um, diverted back into the pool. So over a period of time, um, the pool accumulates this uh, fee and uh, the liquidity provider um, can later at a given stage decide if he wants to liquidate that and he can take away a share of the profitability from the pool. So that is the basic incentive that is provided um, as a part of the automated market making. And a similar intent, incentive is provided by loanable funds. So obviously, because you're taking on a certain risk from the market, you're rewarded by the interest which is provided from the loan. Uh, and again, this is a pre-programmed strategy. So the minute um, the, the, um, the lending and borrowing cycle ends, um, you are allocated the, the profitability or interest which is associated with the loan and directly to your key um, public, uh, sorry, uh, your account or your public address. Now moving on from here. So this is the basic AMM mechanism. Um, and uh, yeah. You, I, I wanna make a couple of remarks about the other slide. So go for it, yeah. Um, um, so in the AMM, one of the most important uh, control controlling functions is the conservation function or mm -hmm. the bonding function. We will go into detail on this in, later on in the presentation. Uh, so, and also we see the two types of actors that are here, mm -hmm. uh, liquidity providers who are the ones who are providing liquidity and traders who are actually uh, using that liquidity to swap one input to an output, uh, which, uh, which is a pair that is uh, locked up in the AMM. Uh, liquidity is meant uh, to be a measure of whether a particular trade can move the market. Uh, in a highly liquid market, huge trades cannot even move the market. Like for example, in US treasury bonds, uh, you know, a single actor cannot change the liquidity. And this uh, meaning cannot change the price. So liquidity and price are intimately related. Uh, and AMMs try to have a conservation function, which is basically a conservation of price by various techniques. We'll go into that in uh, detail uh, later. So please uh, go to the next slide and you can, next slide, and uh, you can talk about this or I can talk about it. What, what, what but but I was just, can I, okay. if I, if it's a, oh yeah. yeah. I was just thinking, yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, is it conservation of price or is it kind of more of a conservation of a spread to create the market? Well, uh, basically, the conservation function um, tries to conserve, uh, you know, the the movement of the price with respect to the size of the trade, right? I mean, the, so in terms of whether it is a conservation of price, um, the ultimate effect should be the conservation of price, but uh, it is achieved through different means or different techniques. Uh, so going back to your question, what, what exactly uh, were you asking? Is no, I, mean, I, I was just, no, I was just thinking, I, mean, I think about it personally just a bit like I'm, you wanna conserve the, the spread because the prices could 
could move. I mean, I think that's fair. It, it's not to fix, it's actually to allow the prices to move, but not, you're right, not that, that's driven on market dynamics, not on the lack of li liquidity per se. I mean, it's supposed to attract the liquidity, but then so it's, I just think of it like more is trying to preserve a spread based on the available liquidity so that the market is at all times optimized for liquidity. So let's talk about that because spread in this case is normally a spread between a stable coin and a token. Since a stable coin is supposed to be low wall and is meant to be pegged to the US dollar or some other currency, uh, the conservation of spread ultimately results in the conservation of price of the token because what the spread is uh, you know, indicating is how volatile is that asset that you're trading, that you're swapping, right? The other asset, the asset other than the stable coin. So in so that, that makes, sense, yeah, go ahead. So, so sorry, that makes a lot of sense because if you're restricting the spread, obviously the price would be, you know, a lot more predictable and stable and the volatility, volatility reduces as a function, right? If you are talking about the spread between uh, two separate tokens that are not stable, then yes, the prices move independent, independently outside. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so I think we can go ahead, but Mark, your question is very valid. What is it conserving, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that is a very valid uh, question. Anyway. Going back to the core actors, the user actions and the pool state. Uh, here, we think of, you know, this is uh, again from one of the references. Core actors are the liquidity pool creator, the liquidity provider and the exchange user, which is basically the investor or the exchange uh, person who does the exchange. Um, uh, that is the user of the pool. But the exchange user can appear in different forms. That is a regular user who wants to just borrow fund, uh, I mean, just convert USD to, let's say, to some token and then uh, invest it, uh, and hold that token. And maybe the price of the token outside the pool will appreciate. And then, uh, you know, then it, once it appreciates, then it can be converted back to a stable form. Uh, but there can be speculative users who can attack the pool and take, uh, you know, cause the pool to crash and profit in the meantime. So, as far as the reserves go, we have uh, you know token A, token B, and token C here. But normally, like I mean, this can this is a multi-token pool, but often the uh, setting is between token uh, a, a pair of tokens, like Kirti said, and all of the activity of the users result in either increases or decreases to the reserves and increases or decreases to the liquidity shares. Uh, and the actions are shown there. Uh, it, this is a very simple model, right? I mean, the actual AMMs have, are composed of these simple actions. In the end, they can construct very complex uh, types of activity using these simple actions. Now, uh, Kirti, you want to say anything more about this or, or the next slide? Please go ahead. Well, um, the, the only thing that I could probably think about is just to kind of give, give like a name to a face. So for example, a uh, liquidity pool creator is someone who would help you facilitate creation of these pools based on, again, uh, some sort of a predefined AMM, uh, you know, um, algorithm which is available out there, like, for example, Uniswap token, uh, Uniswap balancer, you know, all these guys. Now a liquidity provider could be you and me who hold some sort of a 
uh, a cryptocurrency who we will deposit this cryptocurrency with um, you know Uniswap. Uh, they will allocate some sort of a LP token, which is nothing but a liquidity share, which is indicative of the um, the share that we hold in the specific pool state. And of course, exchange users are people who interact to swap their um, you know crypto one for another. So that's that's just the comment that I wanted to make. Hope that's helpful. So moving on to the next slide. So the promise, Vipin, this is your area. Well, basically, uh, what are the why do what is the promise of uh, DeFi of yield farming? Decentralization through automation, because, and uh, of course, once you bring in automation, the speed of the action is magnified, as well as the fact that these operate 24 seven in contrast to regular markets. It's also non-custodial in, in other words, the custody is through the smart contract. So it's not a human custodying it. Uh, and the protocols are often very open and auditable, which has a dual, uh, a, a, you know, a, the sword can cut both ways, meaning um, you can see how good the protocol is, but you can also see the weaknesses in the protocol. Uh, so you can attack the protocol. Uh, composability is a slightly interest, you know, more interesting uh, issue, which is uh, not issue, but a feature of the DeFi. And that's how it has grown so heavily because as we have seen the primitives previously, those primitives, uh, both AMM and uh, loan pools can interact with each other and you can have a workflow that is composed of these primitive actions that can become more and more complex. And obviously other people's code can offer and uh, their workflows and the liquidity provider, I mean, liquidity pool creators can offer this automa automation advantages at a cost. Um, and we can do, as an investor, you can take a totally passive approach, which is similar to the approaches that you see in equities today. Uh, other people create workflows they get paid for it, but you invest using a mutual fund or something else, which is a passive approach. And the automatic, automated strategy, which is switching between uh, the LPs, AMMs and everything else uh, in a predetermined manner can maximize the yield. And pooling transactions make individual execution costs uh, of using gas uh, smaller. It's like uh, pooling and transport, right? I mean, if you go from uh, here to San Francisco by car alone, each one taking the road alone, then the amount of fuel that you burn is huge uh, collectively, but if you all pile into a car, uh, you know, if enough people can ride in this vehicle, then uh, the pooling of the, uh, of the fixed cost of transaction of going from one place to another of creating a transaction becomes smaller for individuals. Anyway, uh, you wanna drive further or talk about this a little more? Um, well, I think one of the most lucrative bits is, you know, your uh, annual percentage yield or the APY metric that you briefly touched upon. Uh, when these pools start, I mean, uh, the gains uh, are phenomenal, like in, in yield, for example, there are some pools which offer up to 2,096% and things like that. But you know, uh, it's again, it's 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 highly promising, but of course, I think we'll we'll touch upon the risk element of it. Uh, you know, in in the next few slides, which says yes, there is a great promise, uh, but 
I think the promise could be a little more controlled and, and a little more refined to kind of minimize the risks. And I think that's what uh, the conversation segue is. So, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, no, no. no, I just wanted to jump in on that point on the, on the APYs. The, the, yeah, it's also like I mean, a, a freshly new, you know, created pool often is reporting its performance based on, you know, a day, a few hours, you know, yeah. maybe a week. It looks very promising, but it doesn't give, of course, the full risk picture either. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, considering on both the, on both the, you know, how we stand, how we think around standardizing or understanding um, the risk in a way that is sort of, uh, yeah, yeah we, accurately we'll go, describing the risk. We'll go into a specific attack that uh, utilizes uh, that ephemeral uh, sort of uh, return to uh, lure investors and then pulls, pulls the rug from under their feet. That kind of one pull attack. We'll, we'll go into that in a minute. Yeah, uh, interesting. Go ahead. Um, uh, Whippin, I, I wanted you to touch upon these uh, liquidity risks and liquidation risks. I think these are very important elements to cover. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the standard issue stuff, which is basically liquidity risk is related to the utilization rate. That means the amount that is in the pool that is lent out. That means if I have a uh, proportion between the amount lent out to the amount that is in the pool, that it can be called a utilization rate. And obviously the maximum that can be lend, lent from the pool is uh, the amount that is in the pool. We are not talking about leverage here. Uh, so utilization rate approaches one, which means almost all of the pool is lent out, the liquidity risk increases. Uh, so lenders can have difficulty getting their funds out when utilization rate is close to one because almost all their, uh, the provided liquidity is gone. Uh, liquidation risk is when the value of the collateral that the borrower has put into the pool falls below a liquidation threshold, the borrower receives the collateral back, which is now worth much less, minus a penalty. Um, it says borrow borrowing using stable coins as collateral decreases this risk because obviously stable coins are meant to be stable. So the liquidation risk in a stable coin uh, collateral will be lower than others. So in these two cases, one is for lenders, the other is for borrowers, the, the risk. Uh, the composability risk uh, can break down into everybody, right? Because the complex strategies can result in your uh, stuff being stolen or lost. Same thing with bugs in smart contracts. Then the recentralization risks, which is, although everybody says this is decentralized, there are pool operators who are nothing but central counterparties in, in fact, uh, and they have control of the admin keys which control the smart contracts so they can actually change the smart contracts uh, and create risk because either you cannot take out any of your uh, collateral or you cannot take out any of the liquidity that you've provided and it gets stolen or it gets uh, diminished in value uh, or you're prevented from trading for a while when the market is moving fast. These are some of the risks that due to recentralization. And that is my, my terminology, recentralization. Uh, you heard it here first. Uh, interacting smart contract risk, it's also like when you audit a smart contract, 
you know that it's safe, but when smart contracts are built on other, call other smart contracts and compose a, a complex strategy, then you can have risks, even though they are secure in isolation, the combination may not be, uh, uh, may not be safe. So that's my take on this. Uh, Kirti, you have to say something about this? Well, um, I think my comment is more to do with um, crypto economic complexity because um, the, these pre-programmed strategies are vast and sometimes um, it's difficult to foresee how the economic system works in, it, in its all elements. And it creates like some weaknesses either within you know the basic contracts which are being used or in the the functions that are being used because of the basic I would say um, parameterization so better parameterization better you know um, controlling parameters uh, that may be required may sometimes not exist for crypto economic complexities of course of course this is a non-regulated market but um, it kind of gives us an indication as to how much work is yet to be done uh, in this specific space before any of this can actually enter you know regulated assets or anywhere close to that scenario just a thought that's it that's right uh, by the way please do not hesitate to ask questions or to make common go ahead We already went through some of these, mm -hmm. the liquidity reward. Uh, staking reward, we didn't really talk about, but uh, it is evident that it is a reward that is accruing to liquidity providers or others who have contributed to the protocol uh, and have staking tokens. And the governance right is, of course, uh, what uh, what is part of deciding how the uh, protocol itself is changing, meaning the conservation functions or the hyperparameters that are attached to the conservation function, which we'll go to in a second. Then there's a security reward, which is if you find a security hole, uh, you can get rewarded for finding that. Obviously, for obvious reasons, many people who find security holes will uh, actually make use of those security holes and uh, uh, get rewarded much more than they would through a security reward. Um, explicit costs, uh, which we did not talk about is liquidity withdrawal penalty that acc accrues to liquidity providers. Swap fee, which is the main engine that drives all AMMs, which is, uh, the users swapping one asset to the other are charged a fee for Uniswap, for example, is 0.3%. Um, and then there's a gas fee that accrues to the protocol, the, the overriding protocol, in this case, Ether, uh, Ethereum gas fees. Then there's implicit costs called slippage, which is basically a difference, a spread uh, between the external spot price of any asset and the spot price inside the pool. That is slippage. And divergent loss is a more complex con construct. That is, if I'm holding a token A, uh, because I'm participating in this pool, my token A is now subject to a token B's uh, price changes. And I can also get the price of my token uh, sort of going down. Um, and it's also called an impermanent loss because impermanent because of the fact that I can take out the token A somehow and trade it in the open market, I can recover that loss or that loss is supposed to you know, go away because arbitrage opportunities open up. And uh, the theory is that arbitrageurs would drive the price back to its 
actual price. Anyway, uh, anything more, Kirti? No, I think we've covered all of it pretty well. Well, I'm 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 feeling that uh, I am an expert more and more as I look at this stuff. <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> I'm just masquerading as an expert. Um, anyway, <laughs> so this is uh, something I love, which is basically any pool can be modeled as a state. And any action by the outsiders, like providing liquidity or doing a swap, basically changes the state of the pool. So all this complex stuff doesn't mean much. It just says that the state is represented by a, uh, a reserve of a token, RK, where, you know, you can go cycle through all the tokens, R1, R2, so on, RK. PK is the price of that token. So the conservation function uh, basically tries to smooth out the state change. Um, and then uh, part of the conservation function C uh, is it, I mean, the conservation function C is also part of the state and omega, which is the hyperparameter attached to the pool. So for liquidity change, you're not supposed to, for a pure liquidity change, only thing that changes is the conservation function action, right? Because the conservation function is the only thing. That, that's why it's marked in red with a C prime. Everything else stays the same. For a swap, on the other hand, the input token price is affected and the output token uh, price is also affected. The output token price is slightly shifts up, the input token price slightly shifts down. Uh, obviously, the price movement has to be kept small. That is a whole idea of AMM. Uh, but it doesn't happen in theory. So this is a pure swap, state transition only changes the price. The pure liquidity change only changes the conservation function. These are the two actions through which the state change happens. But as you can see, the liquidity change, for example, has some swap function built into it because the liquidity, uh, you know, if you withdraw liquidity, you can have a penalty, which obviously results in, in that penalty being reinvested automatically as a swap. So the liquidity has inside it, liquidity change has inside it uh, a, 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 an element of price action. Swap on the other hand is the same thing, right? When you're charging, uh, when you're charging a swap fee, you can uh, change uh, the liquidity, so it can also change the conservation function. So nothing is pure. Every action is got a mixture. Anyway, go ahead. Um, so all I wanted to say was, as an actor, whether you're a liquidity provider or a user or a you know or a trader, you can affect the prices and the way the conservation function behaves. And that is the source of many attacks, which we'll come to in a minute. Um, so these are, you know, some of the curves that were drawn of the relationship between a pool's token one reserve R1 and R2. So let's say Ethereum and US, USDC, uh, you know, you can take, one of them will always be a stable coin. So these are several curves drawn with different hyperparameters. The hyperparameters being slippage or weighting. Uh, 
it's beyond the sc scope of this call to talk about the actual formulae that are, that, was, that are in the conservation functions and how they are affected by the hyperparameters in uh, constant sums or constant product or oracle price functions. Um, it may appear uh, very esoteric, but it's not. If you really delve into it, it's a very simple function. Uh, but people, you know, use basic functions and they build upon it and they look at the attacks and they try to uh, change the function to take care of the attack in their protocol. So Uniswap, for example, has come out with version three, which is a slightly different function from the version one, not slightly, highly different. Anyway, go ahead, uh, uh, Kirti, if you have uh, anything more. Uh, anyway, here we have some attacks that we talk about, which is uh, the Oracle attack. The Oracle attack happens when the price source is only the protocol itself, meaning that pool itself, instead of using price signals from the outside. And as a flash loan happens before, before the um, block is created, that means it, you take out the money and you put it back the money before, before the next block is created. So the price may go bananas. And using that, uh, using that uh, vector, people have attacked many uh, protocols and profited a lot. Um, even though the flash loan attacks are well studied. Just like last month, uh, there was a attack on the pancake bunny or pancake with a flash loan attack. Then the rug pull attack we just uh, we talked about, which is basically during the formation of any pool, a uh, lot of naive investors are drawn into the pool and as uh, a, there may be a, a token pair that is, uh, for example, a brand new token and an established token like USDC, uh, the attacker sells vast amounts of uh, the new token and naive investors buy into it with USDC. And the, attacker converts it into USDC immediately and disappears with the funds because USDC is valuable outside. Well, it doesn't have to be USDC. It can be BUSD or uh, USDT or any of the stable coins. Uh, a quick comment here, Vipin. Um, so the rock pull generally happens in, you know, all these new token issues with wherein you have um, liquidity bootstrapping. That simply means you you start uh, some sort of a pool with very low um, collateral. And that's where something like this happens when you start issuing tokens and then um, the rest of the mechanism is as Whippin clearly explained. So this is, oh, whoa. This, is, this is one of the reasons why you would always see when, when a token is launched, you see the values go up really high, especially you know uh, the the tokens which are launched on these uh, decentralized exchanges. And then, of course, immediately you'll see that the the tokens being dumped and and the value is almost one fourth or uh, possibly one tenth or whatever it, it, it was. So uh, just an interesting note for everyone who trades in crypto. So to keep a, a watch out for this one. Um. I think you know, uh, you, you can explain uh, some of the others, the front running, back running, sandwich attacks. Anyway, 
the whole point is crypto is no, you know, DEX is no protection against this kind of, these kind of attacks. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we have come to the, almost to the end of this uh, slide. I mean, yeah. uh, slide deck. Yeah. Um, we can, uh, we can take questions from the audience. Also, we can make a closing statement in, in a minute if people do not have questions. Igor, no questions? I'm actually thinking of a question. Hi, Rutan. <laughs> so uh, first of all, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. It's been great. Uh, the question that I have in mind uh, is the following. Now, uh, it is my understanding that obviously all these yields are due to high volatility tokens and uh, until all uh, this crypto roller coaster of emotions is not over, it's not going to be regulated. But uh, here's the question. Do you think the market is ready or not for uh, using uh, asset-backed tokens uh, for this kind of uh, instruments and mechanics? Yeah, in fact, that will be our uh, next uh, presentation. How can we, uh, so, so I'll answer it in two ways, right? First thing I have to say is there is nothing new here. Most of these techniques are, are seen in regular, uh, hold on, seen in regular, um, um, you know, in, in traditional markets. Harsh, uh, are you, can I mute you? Or somebody, uh, yeah, it's Harsh, I think. Um, so that's one. Second is, of course, the main difference between traditional markets and this is the speed and the 24 seven and the automation. And the fact that we have naive investors, but naive investors have been shown not to be naive, right? Uh, especially with like meme stocks and other, other phenomena. So uh, I would say that it is soon coming to traditional market. The front end, the, the, the trading part is already done, meaning we have program trading uh, being active in, in the world for a long time. Obviously there were many, many problems with it, which we don't really see. Some of them are, uh, you know, ways in which uh, the program trading has gone wrong with flash crashes and other phenomena. They usually have circuit breakers, which we we also have in, uh, at, uh, in a sense inside the AMMs. Uh, so there is, so to answer your question, I think, yes, it, it's going to happen. How soon, we don't know. And you know, they, they'll adopt every technique, we don't know. Lupin, can I add a couple of comments? Yes, of course. Yes, so uh, Igor, um, one, one of the simplest um, answers to your question could also be that we could utilize some parts or some smart contracts or tools which exist today from the DeFi space and create some sort of a hybrid model. Uh, obviously it won't extreme, be an extreme uh, DeFi space. It'd be more like a CeFi arrangement to still be able to do some sort of uh, liquidity provision for niche assets, which are traditionally not traded through a specific exchange. And these methodologies could still be used. And of course, like uh, Whippin said, we're still a little far away from it, but we are researching into that area. We are trying to kind of find out the right balances of uh, ring fencing capital, putting in these uh, circuit breakers uh, where necessary and of course, providing the right level of protection, which is required for both institutional customers as well as you know retail customers. Yeah, uh, I, we have to unfortunately close at the top of the hour for various reasons. It looks like the next uh, group is here already, uh, but um, keep the questions coming for another minute, uh, and we can close with you know. 
we can close soon enough. Kirti, unless you have uh, a minute or two. No, I, I could just simply like to make a closing statement to say that while um, DeFi and DeFi space is absolutely innovative uh, in nature, uh, I think there is a huge potential for uh, capital markets to learn from some of these techniques and use that in, in a very conservative way, in a hybrid way, um, put in a lot of controls where required and create some sort of a, a CFI hybrid where necessary. Uh, to utilize and harness some of the automation power that DeFi brings into the existential space. So uh, that's, and we are still uh, quite far away from being able to do this, but we'll get there, I guess, eventually, because we now we know and we understand uh, what the vulnerabilities are. So that's my statement, Whippin. Yeah, um, I'm of the opinion that, uh, you know, a lot of these things are, are have been there before, like for example, DEX as a concept was decentralized exchange was created uh, back in, I think in the 90s. The other one is uh, the fact that, uh, you know, also AMMs have been conceived of, but until the arrival of blockchain and of tokens, tokenization, it hadn't really taken off. So that's that's it from me. Um, we will continue to explore this space. And in terms of Harsh asking the question whether how can we get involved, uh, please uh, interact on the email list or on the wiki page and we can do it. All right, thank you. And I think we are leaving now and I'm, uh, Unfortunately, I'm going to have to relinquish my host. Uh, can I assign it to one of you guys uh, who have just joined uh, since you are going to be running the next meeting? Yeah, you can assign it. This is Andrew Richardson. I'm actually going to run the next uh, talk if you want to assign it to me. Yeah. Or you could sure. send it to Nico. Nico just joined as well, either of us. Yep, I'm okay. happy to take it. Okay, so I'm going to, first thing I'm going to do is, I'm going to